Welcome back to Lecture 6. So in this part of Lecture 6, we're going to explore the mechanical response of the Maxwell element. We're going to derive a simple differential equation that we're going to apply to two common deformations that we find in rheometry, that of steady shear and also that of what happens to stress after we stop steady shear. What we're going to see is that our Maxwell element starts to capture some of the behaviour that we see in viscoelastic liquids, but also we're going to see that it fails to capture other sorts of behaviour, which in turn gives us motivation for developing this constitutive model a lot further, such that we can model the entire range of behaviour that we see in common viscoelastic liquids. So, let's start by reminding ourselves what the Maxwell element looks like. So here on the blackboard is our Maxwell element. And the key thing that we acknowledged in the last part of this lecture was that the strain of the overall element, gamma, is made up of the sum of the strain of the individual parts of the element, the strain of the dash pot and the strain of the spring. If that is true, we can also say that the strain rate of the element, gamma dot, is equal to the sum of the strain rates of the individual parts gamma dot 1 plus gamma dot 2. And this is how we're going to derive our equation for the mechanical response. So if we think of the stress in the spring and the stress in the viscous damper, and remember the fact that they're equal, tau 2 equals tau 1 equals tau, then we can substitute expressions for the strain rate for the damper directly into our strain rate expression. And when we look at the strain expression for our spring, we can differentiate it with respect to time and substitute the result into our strain rate expression as well. So let's do that. And if we do that, we find that we have this equation up here. So d gamma by dt, that's the strain rate of the Maxwell element, is 1 over g d tau by dt. That comes from looking at our spring differentiating the stress expression, so we get d tau 1 by dt equals d gamma 1 by dt times g. And then we have on the right hand side tau over eta, which is just a rearrangement of the strain rate stress expression for our viscous damper. Now what we're going to do is introduce a time scale. As we'll see in a few um, minutes, the concept of a relaxation time is actually very relevant when thinking about how quickly the stress in a polymer system relaxes. So our relaxation time we're going to define as eta over g and we're going to use a substitution of that into our Maxwell expression so we get g d gamma dt equals d tau by dt plus tau over lambda. Let's quickly think about something. Let's think about frame of reference. When we've looked at how we derive this expression for mechanical response our frame of reference has been the Maxwell element. Imagine that this Maxwell element is now in a flow. This implies that this expression has been derived in a Lagrangian sense. We've followed the Maxwell element in the flow. We've observed it at all time. And since we've observed it at all time, we can see quite easily what history, what deformation history that Maxwell element has been subject to. We don't always use a Lagrangian frame of reference. If we think about our other frame of reference, our Eulerian frame of reference, our lab frame of reference, where we observe a point in the flow and watch material flow past that point of reference, we suddenly have a problem with the way that this equation has been derived. Because if we think about it, if all we're examining is a point in the flow, then we have Maxwell elements coming into view and out of view. Because we only see the Maxwell element for a short period of time, we don't know its stress history. And as we'll see in a few minutes, Maxwell elements remember stress because they remember their deformation. So if all we do is look at a point in the flow, how do we work out what the stress history of all the elements are? We'll worry about that later. I want to raise that now as an important point as to how we've derived that expression. Frame of reference is very, very important. What we find in a practical sense is that if our relaxation times are really fast and our slows are really flow, slow, we can use that equation for some rheometric use. So, with that caveat stated, let's think about shear flow. Our shear flow 
is produced between two parallel plates shown here in yellow and the fluid is in blue and I'm moving my top plate at a velocity v and holding the bottom plate stationary. If you look at the plot on the blackboard you'll see that the flow has been established for long enough for the stress in the flow shown in orange to be a steady state. So neither my strain rate nor my stress vary as a function of time. Let's have a look at the differential equation that we produced for our Maxwell element. On the left hand side g d gamma by dt is g gamma dot. We can see that gamma dot is non-zero and it takes the value gamma dot ss. If we look at the right hand side we have the derivative with respect to time of stress which is zero because it's constant so that falls to zero and we have then tau over lambda which becomes tau ss over lambda. So if we work this through and make a substitution for our relaxation time we can see that Maxwell predicts a Newtonian viscosity in steady shear, which we know isn't the case. We've seen real data for polyethylene, and that was strongly shear thinning. Some viscoelastic liquids present a Newtonian viscosity in steady shear. They're called Boga fluids. However, a lot of fluids show shear thinning. So in effect, we've taken a step backwards in our capability to describe real materials when we look at this simple form of the Maxwell constitutive law. If we think why this is the case, imagine for a minute, if you will, that our Maxwell element now consists of a spring with a very high modulus, so it takes almost infinite force to produce a strain with it, and a viscous damper with a very low viscosity. Because we have strain additivity, if I deform my element, all the deformations happening in the damper, which is governed by my viscosity. So perhaps on reflection, it is not a great surprise that Maxwell, as we've written it, just describes Newtonian viscosity in steady shear. Let's see what Maxwell now predicts if we stop our strain rate. So our steady strain rate at time t0 on the blackboard suddenly ceases. Our steady stress tau0 we want to know what happens. We've seen from our experiment with a Voigt element, my bicycle pump with the TheraBand, that what we might expect is the stress to decay slowly. This isn't a Voigt element, this is a Maxwell element, but we would expect there to be still some sort of stress memory. So let's have a look at our Maxwell constitutive law. There we have g d gamma by dt. If we examine the time period after t0, we don't have a strain rate any longer, it's zero. So g d gamma by dt falls to zero. On the right hand side, we have our stress behavior with respect to time, which is what we want to find out. So if we take that expression, rearrange it, integrate it, we end up with the form of an exponential decay. Tau of t equals tau zero exponential of t minus t0 over lambda. Now you can see why we wanted to write all these expressions with lambda. Lambda is our characteristic time scale for stress relaxation. So let's see how that might look on a graph. So there now in orange we have our exponential decay of stress. So Maxwell has stress memory. This is a step in the right direction. So despite the prediction of Newtonian viscosity, Maxwell can uh, reproduce one of the phenomena that we see in viscoelastic liquids, which is that they remember their stress because they remember what's happened to them in terms of a deformation. So our state of stress in a viscoelastic liquid is no longer linked to the instantaneous deformation rate. We have stress memory. So let's have a look at what this stress decay might look like for different values of lambda. If we take a limit that lambda approaches zero, that my relaxation is instantaneous, there is no memory. By the very nature of an instantaneous relaxation, yeah, we end up with zero stress memory. Let's, however, take it the other way and we can see that, well, if we've got an infinite relaxation time, the material doesn't relax at all. And so we just end up with the stress staying there. Real values of lambda for polymeric systems, solutions or melts will vary between roughly the millisecond time scale, 10 to the minus 3 seconds, out to the hour time scale, 10 to the 3 seconds. 
And this has great ramifications of how we do the rheological characterization because we assume in a rheological characterization we're starting from a zero stress system. If we have relaxation time of order hours, then you're going to have to have left your sample in your rheometer a very, very long time for that stress to have decayed to zero. Let's recap some key points. We've looked at the mechanical response of a simple Maxwell element and we found that it's actually far from perfect. We get a Newtonian response in steady shear, which is bad, but we do get the presence of a stress memory. We emphasised the importance of the frame of reference when we derived the stress expression for this element. Our frame of reference was the Maxwell element, not a flow within which the Maxwell element sits. We only have one relaxation time in this Maxwell element. And if we make the analogy again between our Maxwell element and a polymer chain, that suggests that we've only got one length of polymer chain because we've only got the one characteristic relaxation time scale. In the real world, polymer systems are what we call polydisperse. There are many different molecular weights, lots of different chain lengths, which will relax at different time scales. They'll have a, a spectrum of relaxation times, not one relaxation time. So we have to question whether the simple Maxwell model that we've derived would actually fit a real experimental system. So we have seen that we've got stress memory, we've got Newtonian response, we've got the inability to describe probably real systems because of this polydispersity problem, and we've got this frame of reference problem. All these problems are things that we're going to sort out in future lectures such that we can develop Maxwell to the point where we can apply it to real systems in an accurate sense.